Hello everyone, this is Alex Tiki on behalf of PCR Online. Dear friends, fellows from all over the world and PCR companions, our special guest today is one of the living legend of the interventional cardiology. Pioneer of the most significant innovations in our field he is professor of medicine at Columbia University Hirby Medical Center, chief innovation officer and director of the cardiovascular data center for the division of cardiology at Columbia University, and nonetheless, the founder and the chairman emeritus of the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. It's a privilege to give a warm welcome to Professor Martin Leon. Thanks so much, Dr. Leon, for being with us. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I have such warm feelings and strong support for PCR and PCR London Valves. So anything I can contribute to the meeting and to my colleagues in Europe, I'm glad to have this conversation. Thanks so much, Prof. Uh, so we have seen a, a terrific evolution of the TAVI field from the first case performed by uh, Dr. Alan Cribier in uh, the 16th April of 2002. Um, and now we have four trials investigating the role of TAVI in low-risk patients, uh, comparing the transcatheter approach with the, the uh, surgery in a randomized fashion. Uh, Dr. Nyon, you presented the, the five-year clinical and echocardiographic outcomes of the uh, partner free low risk uh, randomized trial at TCT contemporary published uh, on New England. So what uh, uh, this five-year uh, follow-up of the partner free bring has to our attention as a main message? That's an excellent question. I'm gonna set the stage just a little bit. When we began with the La Crevier more than 20 years ago, the concept was to develop a beating heart transcatheter approach to aortic valve replacement that could be used in the sickest of the sick patients that were not candidates for surgery. No one would have imagined over the course of a decade or two that we have now evolved this therapy in such a way that has become routine clinical practice, over 100,000 a year in the US alone, and that we would be treating not just these extreme risk patients, but all the risk strata, the culmination of which are the low risk patients that we initially published the one-year outcomes uh, in 2019. And now we have the opportunity to talk about the five-year outcomes in this same population. I will tell you now in the United States, it is estimated that of the aortic valve replacements done in patients below the age of 65, almost 50% are TAVR, which is a much larger number than we had imagined. So if this is true, and if this is the trend, we need to have long-term data in younger patients to have a better understanding of, of whether or not this therapy is as durable and as effective as surgery has been in low-risk patients. And that's the genesis of the low-risk trials. This is the first of the low-risk trials with really a substantial cohort, a thousand patients, randomized one-to-one -one against surgery that prospectively followed these patients with serial echocardiograms, serial clinical follow-up in the formal way we do randomized trials, now reaching the five-year endpoint for all patients. So what are the results at five years? Uh, first, I can say that we had good follow-up in all patients and that we were able to demonstrate that the clinical outcomes, and that was defined by the first a primary endpoint, which was a triple composite endpoint of death, stroke, and repeat hospitalization. And the hospitalization was for cardiovascular causes. But that endpoint, which showed um, uh, certainly results that were at least as good as surgery at one year, that it continues to show an outcome which is at least equivalent numerically slightly superior to surgery at five years with a slight attenuation in the overall outcome so that we can tell our patients at the end of five years that if you look at cardiovascular mortality and you're a low-risk patient, that both surgery and TAVR are extremely effective. There's about a 1% per year mortality and about a 1% per year stroke rate for either of those therapies, and about a 3% per year hospitalization rate. So these are very strong data. And we can also tell our patients 
but more than 70% of the time for either surgery or TAVR. And we use the balloon expandable Sapien 3 device in this study. But um, uh, 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 more than 70% of the time that you're going to be alive and you're going to have essentially no symptoms, very minor or no symptoms. So those are very strong positive points that speak to the clinical durability of this therapy compared to surgery. Additionally, we looked at the echo results to understand more structural valve deterioration, looking for the subtle signs that speak to the valve durability. And we were also very pleased to find that when we look at gradients, when we look at aortic valve areas, when we look at paravalvular regurgitation, and particularly when we look at both bioprosthetic valve failure and structural valve deterioration, we see that the TAVR arm and the surgery arm are essentially superimposable with very low levels of failure at five years. So there is no early signal of premature deterioration of the bioprosthetic transcatheter versus surgical valves. So these are very um, positive and important findings because it tells us that we that the transcatheter therapy, at least in the low risk patients in this study, uh, is a very, very reasonable and meaningful alternative to surgery, both of which give good results and durable midterm results to five years, recognizing that we need to follow these patients for the next five years to have a more conclusive determination of ultimate durability of these devices. That's that, that's amazing. They, they are really, really strong messages. And uh, in, in this uh, fantastic uh, uh, evolving field of TAVI. What, according to you, are the last gaps, the gaps one, two, three, that we need to investigate at this point? That That's a great question. Um, I mentioned that we're now treating younger patients. We don't have a lot of data in younger patients. If we are really going to start treating the totality of the AS population, that we need to start treating younger patients. So we need more evidence, more data in younger patients mm -hmm. to be certain that the results are as good as surgery. We have treated some patients with bicuspid disease, but we've not done that in a systematic way. And the reality is we need more evidence in various versions of bicuspid aortic valve disease to feel confident that, our th that this therapy is gonna be um, similar to surgery and outcomes. We expect as we treat younger patients, but um, we, we are gonna require uh, repeat procedures and this concept of therapy sequencing and the effect of repeat procedures, uh, either uh, TAVR in a surgical failed valve or TAV and TAV, which we think within three years is probably gonna exceed the TAVR in surgery in terms of frequency due to the expected valve failures that we will see in the TAVR patients, we need to have a better understanding as to what is the best sequence and what is the best secondary therapy in these patients. So these are some of the areas that I think need to be explored. There are some secondary things that we're very interested in. We're still not sure what the best pharmacology is in these patients. So understanding correctly what is the uh, appropriate um, systemic pharmacotherapy that would be most effective I think is another very important uh, um, goal that we're looking at. Um, and, and we need to look at a, a variety of ancillary devices that we are developing uh, for leaflet modification, a new leaflet, um, a technology that may have more durable um, effects. Um, we're continuing to explore the minimalist approach. Um, so many different things. And finally, I would say one of the studies that we presented at TCT was the first pivotal trial in aortic regurgitation, where we had a dedicated TAVR device. And I think that's a completely new open field of how we approach aortic regurgitation in the future. Yes, um, it's, uh, it's, really, it's, it's exciting also because we are seeing also an evolution in the technology that is uh, something, uh, something amazing. And uh, Prof, you are a pioneer in educational also. Uh, what is the best suggestion for fellows interested to perform and investigate structural intervention? One of the nice things about structural heart disease that we have seen uh, a 
a, a tremendous commitment and engagement among young investigators to participate in clinical trials. So I would start by participating in clinical trials. I would start with developing your own specific questions within the space that can be addressed in initial pilot studies and can grow into stronger clinical trials. I would suggest that there are new ways to be able to bring evidence that help us to answer questions, things that we call pragmatic clinical trials that can be derived from large administrative databases. Um, that's becoming more available. And I would suggest that you become familiar with some of the leaders in the field. And certainly the PCR London Valves meeting, which is beginning next week, that will have close to 3,000 people, really would give you an introduction to what are some of the new spaces, who are some of the major investigators, and what are the opportunities to become involved in clinical research. Thanks so much, Prof. It was uh, really a privilege to talk with you. Thanks so much for your kindness, and thanks everyone to enjoy this interview. Thanks so much, and see you in London. Uh, we'll definitely see you in London. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prof. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.